Kais Stetkovic is um, a researcher on um, Norse literature, Viking martial arts, and today we are going to be talking about, I guess, I guess we're going to start with the interest in Viking martial arts. Would that be fair enough, Kais? That is fair enough. That is fair enough. Okay. So tell us, tell us, tell us about your interest. Where did it begin? Viking martial arts. Where did that all start from with you then? Uh, two, two parts, two hobbies, if you will, kind of dovetailed together um, 15 years ago or so. Uh, I grew up reading Norse saga literature, so old Norse histories from about a thousand years ago. Um, just like some, I guess, kids grow up reading Greek mythology. Uh, I grew up reading Greek and Norse mythology, but uh, contemporaneously with Norse mythology, all these sagas were written, you know, roughly 800, 1,000 years ago. Uh, and in those, there was lots of wrestling. As a kid, I didn't pay much attention to that. Even though I'd wrestled in high school, it, it didn't click. But then years later, I started doing jujitsu and mixed martial arts um, quite seriously. And simultaneously after university in which I was a history major, um, I got an opportunity to do a master's program in Iceland on technically, uh, what was the original name? Viking and medieval Norse studies. Um, but as I'll get to in a moment, there was nothing Viking about it. In fact, Viking is almost always inaccurate, um, not to be a stickler on that kind of stuff, but you know, the name sells, but they were, they were farmers. Um, and farmer martial arts or farmer <laughs> warfare is uh, not, not quite as exciting. Um, but so these, these two passions, the more I got into jujitsu, the more, as I talk about in my thesis and as we've talked about, the more embodied knowledge you get with how the body works, how the physics work. And with that, I was remembering, but also rereading a lot of these sagas. And I realized this culture, this being Scandinavia and Icelandic culture, they loved their wrestling. And it was in all their histories. It was in all their stories, all their mythologies. Um, and so I, I decided to do a master's paper, kind of just pointing out, this is this move, this is this move without any kind of analysis or background. Mm -hmm. um, and that's morphed into a PhD thesis now and a, a passion, if you will. Um, but as, as I suspect you're going to, to throw me another softball, um, <laughs> you, you encounter some, some unsavory types when you delve too deeply into uh, uh, well, <laughs> Norse uh, genealogy, if you will. Well, I think there's two things that we want to explain, explore today. One is, your, your, your research, your findings and your argument about the status of king, things like grappling and wrestling in the Norse sagas and, and in Norse culture. And also what I know you've also encountered in, in rummaging around in the literature, the, the, the kind of amateur scholarship and also the practitioner, the world of practitioners of reconstruction of, of martial arts. Some of the kind of problematic receptions or developments of Viking mythology first so should we where should we start let's start with the the, the the serious stuff like let's start with the your argument what's your thesis about wrestling and grappling and Norse sagas and Viking culture if there is such a thing uh it's funny because I spend a lot of my time poo-pooing Viking culture as we kind of project our desires onto it but I actually love the real culture um, so it, the more I work and the more I encounter, we'll say different viewpoints, the more, uh, I, the less welcomed I am in that area, but for a very good reason, which I'll get to now, which is, uh, studying these techniques. So the, the, the thesis, the, the, the sales pitch here is the, wrestling techniques that are in the sagas are also, the sagas are kind of a cultural item of Scandinavia, particularly Iceland. So they're very um, nationally, or I'll say in the benign sense, nationalistically proud of it. 
Uh, and rightfully so, it's great literature, great stories, great history, and great wrestling. The problem is there's a modern wrestling called glima in Iceland that's a sport very much like um, Scottish backhold or Cumberland wrestling. And that modern sport, lots of current experts and just proud Scandinavians, I guess, they like to kind of project what that modern sport is back on the sagas and to claim, and I'm sure you've heard this from every different martial art, to claim that there's an unbroken chain or lineage of knowledge from a thousand years ago to now, and that this is how our ancestors fought. And this is how, um, these are the techniques they did and even more bastardized, this is how the Vikings fought. Do you wanna fight like a Viking? This is how to do it. Um, so I see, you know, especially about 10 years ago, um, Vikings started riding a wave that kind of culminated in that the TV series Vikings. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, we'll say, took, you know, culture by storm. Uh, and with that came all sorts of out of the woodwork experts on how to fight like a Viking. Um, but being an expert grappler in a broad sense and also a, uh, expert old Norseman, or at very least literature enthusiast, um, I, I saw very early on and with, you know, almost immediately, you read the passages in the sagas and you uh, hear what other people, you know, modern contemporaries are saying, what kind of style of fighting that was, and there's a big disconnect. Um, so my argument is the actual wrestling in these historic texts is really kind of a pan, not even European, pan, you know, pan national um, or international uh, freestyle or folk style wrestling. And that a lot of the techniques done are, I would say generic wrestling moves that you can find in almost every culture, any culture that grapples, which is all of them uh, for the most part, has these same basic techniques so I find it a little absurd um, now that Vikings are so popular that people are saying all of these techniques are, this is Icelandic or this is Scandinavian, uh, when really that's like, you know, that's like trying to say the punch is American. Um, you're not gonna sell me on that, especially when I have evidence from all over the world throughout history with the same Scandinavian moves, you know, pre-Scandinavia, that's, that's interesting. Um, you know, the ancient Egyptians carved Scandinavian wrestling techniques on their walls. That's uh, mm. unlikely. <laughs> so part of my argument is that um, that's, that would be the more, at least in this, the more political aspect. Uh, and then more broadly, I'm also just, uh, I wouldn't say experimenting because I, I've figured it out at least a little piece of it. Uh, but I'm also showing in my in my thesis that these techniques uh, from a written historical source. So th this is kind of more applicable for other martial arts who want to maybe look into this kind of thing. Uh, but these techniques can be recreated if, the dis if you have enough cultural knowledge, enough linguistic knowledge and enough embodied knowledge, um, you can kind of dissect and decipher what these techniques are, mm. pending upon about you know, a list of 20 or so things that you can make sure are, uh, you know, um, 20 different backgrounds of knowledge. It, it's a bit complicated. Uh, and I figured out in my area of expertise, how to pinpoint and identify these wrestling techniques. But for other martial arts, I would need a completely different set of cultural and embodied knowledge kind of tools. But part of the point of this, thesis is to show other people, I can do this in my field, so maybe this is something you could do in yours. Uh, now, not all martial arts have written history, uh, and not all of them have writers who would actually have tr been passionate and practitioners themselves. So there's lots of different little moving pieces, but I, I try to show to the best of evidence's ability that for at least wrestling and at least within the sagas, um, we can accurately identify moves that are being described a thousand years ago. And as a little caveat, um, they aren't Viking techniques. They're actually broader 
kind of more fundamental wrestling techniques. So you seem to be saying a couple of different things, I think. So on the one hand, you, yeah. you're, you're a universalist in the sense that Bruce Lee was, which is we've got two hands and two feet by and large, unless we're a, a, a Viking demon or a, a Scandinavian monster or witch or troll or something like that. So we've got two hands and two feet. So uh, grappling and wrestling techniques against another human, we're going to discover them in all cultures ultimately. But at the same time as that, we if we have that kind of theoretical or principled universalism or universality, there are specific cultural factors that we need to be aware of before we can be confident that we've reconstructed. So you're saying modern Gleamer cannot just be traced back to 800 years ago because of rules, expectations, point scoring, clothes they're wearing, I guess? Yeah, they wear, a, I mean, there's a modern harness used now, but even without the harness, which is probably like a 120 year old invention, even without that, uh, glima is uh, also a verb, uh, more so archaic, used to mean wrestling in general in, in Old Norse. So like we use the term wrestle and explaining this in long form makes sense, but in a brief conversation, it's a little confusing. But as we use the term wrestle as an actual Olympic sport, but also, you know, kids wrestling around, mm -hmm. they use the verb glima. So that creates all sorts of problems and all sorts of arguments and tension between me and other um, scholars or enthusiasts of the sport because they say, look, Glima, mm -hmm. but these are, these are Icelanders or these are Swedes. They know that it's the same word, mm -hmm. but to advertise to their, I don't want to say flock, but almost, uh, to advertise to their followers, they like to leave out that little, you know, nuance that the word was very broad. So they said they went to Glima, but that just means they went to grapple or wrestle. Mm. Whereas nowadays, it's an official sport with very specific rules. Back then, it just meant to wrestle. Mm -hmm. And another wrench in the gears that that is hard to explain to the layman for, you know, uh, uh, hard to prove to the layman, it's easy to explain, is that the, the glima now, modern glima, for the most part, did also exist back then. So that really muddies the waters. It's just not what they were doing to actually fight. Mm. Um, so there is a lot of ammunition on the other uh, people opposing my view. A lot of the traditionalists, I'll say, uh, or p Viking purists, they argue, well, glima, the word is glima, they say they glima, they describe it as glima, and culturally people did it back then. And there, there are, but I think they're being disingenuous. In fact, I know they're, they're either being unintentionally ignorant or intentionally disingenuous. Um, the bottom line is it doesn't really matter which, but if you look at the source material, which is finite, there's, uh, sagas that contain wrestling. There's about 25 good sagas with good real wrestling in them and a bunch of other shorter stories uh, and references to wrestling elsewhere. But if you read the corpus of actual uh, sagas that contain wrestling in them or glima, you, pretty objectively with any even broad, only modern sense of wrestling, you can pretty objectively tell this these two guys were doing a sport like like uh, backhold wrestling for fun. Mm -hmm. And this guy is trying to kill this guy and, and smash his head into the ground or mm -hmm. suplex him for damage. Um, and the and the techniques have nothing in common um, okay. from the horse's mouth, if you will. Now, okay. another wrench is that the authors are all anonymous. So of the sagas. So authorial intention is always tricky mm. but when the author is anonymous mm. it, it's it's up in the air but i do have the argument that looking you know zooming out and really looking from a, a broad angle view you can see that culturally wrestling was very popular mm. a thousand years ago and that these authors they used specific terms and specific described techniques in specific ways mm -hmm. and gave hints in in writing uh that 
narrowed down what move it could possibly be. So it's very clear that these authors did either participate in or at very least understand their wrestling. Um, and actually good old Sixth Wetzler, um, I was talking to him years ago and he put in his PhD, I don't know, five years ago, um, he pointed out as well that they do, uh, they, 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 uh, I'm, I'm losing my trail here. Uh, <laughs> There's too many trails to pursue. Yeah, I know. Feed, feed me a word. I'll jump well, back. I was, I mean, well, I was going to, because you, you, you basically moved into the terrain I wanted to ask about, which was, which was a couple of things. One is there are a set of questions about how you feel confident that you can, that you can know that they're describing certain moves that you would say that in judo is called this or that in, uh -huh. uh, in, in wrestling is called this. But um, you also, because we've chatted about this before and you say that on the one hand, there's descriptions that you can say like, he grabbed him by the such and such and then he landed on his head or he landed on his shoulder. And you can go, therefore from that, we can infer it must have been a hip throw or a shoulder throw or a suplex or something like this. But then you've also said that at times in the sagas, they'll just throw in a word and say it was a such and such hold or and they don't even explain it from which you have um, you argue that therefore the readership can be exactly. assumed to know. So that exactly. your argument is that uh, wrestling types of combat permeated the cultural context. People just knew it's a bit like today someone say, might say, oh, it's an open goal. Well, that was an own goal. Exactly. Like, everyone yeah. knows what that means. Is it that kind of context we're talking about? Very much. And one of the problems is it's a pretty big corpus. So there, I, and, and this is conjecture, but to me, when reading it, there are authors who either didn't care about the wrestling or didn't know it. And they say, he threw him and his head exploded or he threw him on the ground and he died. And they either don't care which is fine because that, you know, the focal point of the scene isn't the wrestling, but there's other times where it's very descriptive. He grabbed him by the left arm mm -hmm. and threw him over his hip so that his head hit the ground. Mm -hmm. Pretty easy and not just wrestling, but even if you only knew judo from, you know, and you were Japanese and only knew judo, you could still piece together what that is. Yeah. But there's also, uh, so, so there's very detailed descriptions, which I couldn't do the project if those authors didn't have at least some detailed mm -hmm. descriptions. But there's other times the author just says, like you said, one word. They say uh, he used a, a heel or heil crocker, which is a heel crook, which is actually still a technique used in, in Glima. Um, it's a kind of trip. Um, but obviously, if, if you're using a term like that, and that's the only description you get, you're either a very bad and se or selfish writer, like it's a memoir, or you know you have a experienced readership or audience, mm. um, and kind of auxiliary, you know, as an auxiliary point, lots of saga culture, especially if you look up at the kind of demographics of Iceland and the rest of Scandinavia, it it's passed on from oral tradition. So people would tell these stories to a group for entertainment. And if it's a group of people who, who literally the national sport was and still is wrestling or glima, adding that into the stories makes them more exciting and adding them in uh, realistically is gonna make your audience appreciate it more. And I, I argue and suspect it went from oral tradition to written. And once it was cemented in written form, luckily uh, that allows us to look at it a thousand years later and, and go, hey, I know that move. Never been there, but, uh, you know, ne never trained that, but, and I'm not a Viking, but I know that move. So what's the problem then? So you can, you can read these texts in the original or in translation, and you can go, hang on, that's a shoulder throw, that's a hip throw, that's a, that's this and this. What, what are your problems then with the people who, who advertise themselves as teaching or practicing uh, Viking combat more broadly? What, what's, what are some of the main problems with that? uh hubris <laughs> the, <laughs> often it's their personality and how they present it you know if it was academic or a rational argument but it's always for it's hard to respect an argument when there's a conflict of interest and economic benefit to people not understanding it fully uh but my my problem is 
uh, well, I, I, there's two sets of problems. My philosophical problem with what they're doing. And then when I've actually, I say confront, it's not violent, it's usually online in messages, but I find groups that advertise this and I try to interact with them and I say, hey, you're saying that these are, and again, this is in the, the, the monotone medium of, of you know, typed message. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm trying not to sound aggressive or sassy but you but, don't know how you're coming across. <laughs> yeah, but but it's also hard to come across as, you yeah. know, it's hard to come across as polite when you're saying, hey, this is really interesting. Just wondering, I've read all source texts and your moves aren't in them. So where are you getting them? <laughs> it's hard to start on the right foot. Yeah. And I'm also not, you know, I, I'm not going to play dumb just to say gotcha later. So I kind of, I've, confronted and asked lots of people or experts. Uh, and it usually is a very brief, often rude conversation uh, or just never get a reply or I get blocked or I get kicked out of the group or, um, because as I said, there, you can't have a objective discussion about this with someone when their finances are on the line, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what are the, I mean, why do you want to spoil people's fun? I mean, why do why, <laughs> why does it bother you if someone if they want to put a helmet on with some horns, and, <laughs> and they want what and they want to I, I, soldier and what? Why does that? What? what I, su them? I suspect that's a leading question. But uh, first of all, it doesn't bother me, and if people are doing it and enjoying it, that's good. Uh, but the the academic or the educator side of my brain wants people who, who enthusiasts, hobbyists, or professionals to know the truth of what you're doing. I think there's something profoundly comforting, at least personally for me, in knowing that what I'm doing is actually, you know, I was a, his, I was a history major and a history buff long before uh, I delved into martial arts studies. And history is filled with amazing stories but finding out whether they're true or not or to what extent mm. the more true the story is the more evidence you have that it's real the better it is even if it's less fantastic you know and it, it, honestly it has to do with integrity because nowadays i, I do jujitsu i do mma i do muay thai i do wrestling uh and these are all fairly uh uh, evolving techniques and there's not much at least you know the martial arts I'm participating in don't have much historical or cultural baggage um, jiu-jitsu even though I learned it from Brazilians who learned Brazilian jiu-jitsu in Brazil there's a little bit you know some Japanese vestiges with the gi and some bowing and respect etiquette which I'm all for you know can never have too much respect on the mat um, but with the, the Viking martial arts, there's none of that structure. And really it's all, you know, <laughs> you know, why do I not, why does it bother me? Because it's watching people project their own insecurities and desires on a history that I love and kind of bastardizing it while they do it. Mm. And also they're just factually incorrect. So they're, you know, Believing a lie is one thing. Teaching a lie makes you the bad guy, in my opinion, you know? Mm -hmm. If you've been duped, that's fine, you know? Everyone can be duped. But if you know you were duped or, mm -hmm. and you choose to do that to other people, knowing that you're not being honest with them, yeah. you know, integrity, ma character matters. <laughs> I, I have a vision in my head now of... Um, that, that I, used to, I used to watch some of the videos that were shared by McDojo Life. I stopped when, when they started to try and sell too much stuff. But is I used it, to- That's Master was, Ken, a, right? Is it, well, it's like Master Ken, but no, there's a guy and, and there's some big steroided up bloke, like real like, and, and he's got an ax and his training partner's got a shield or a buckler and, and, and he goes, boom, boom. And then it just smashes straight through the shield and stabs him straight. And they're like, oh, oh, and it's like just complete, like, I don't know, it's like LARPing to the to the nth degree. But the serious question is, I mean, you you've also 
you presented a, at the conference uh, last year about the kind of these these Viking reconstructionist groups that also have very questionable, I don't know, ethnic and racial and nationalistic politics, right? I mean, yeah. are these North American groups? Are these European groups? And what, are, they, are these a, a worry? Should are these a, a force to worry about, or what do they signify? Well, I like I like that last question because that's important. I could scare you with boogeyman stories about how horrible these people are. The reality is, uh, I don't think. Well, th this goes into the political realm. And actually, a big part of my argument um, regarding white nationalists and why they find such a strong allure to Viking martial arts, which, as I've alluded to already, they aren't really Viking and they aren't very, they're not even Scandinavian particularly specific. Um, so there's not really that ethnic link. And then it's not Viking either. That's like saying pirate fighting. I'm going to fight like a pirate, you know? Uh, you sound like a clown. And you are a clown if you want to fight like a pirate. I mean, it, it can be fun and cool, but don't take people's money and train them thinking that because you've taught them how you think of pirate fights, that they can now defend themselves against an attacker. Um, <laughs> but one of the big problems with with this kind of, Viking heritage and nationalism uh, is that social media has magnified it. And we, we hear the phrase a lot, given it a stage. Mm. Um, so you asked whether it's American or Scandinavian it, it's, or, or European, it's, it's everywhere now because it's wherever the internet is. Um, so you, in lots of the literature studying from, from actual academics looking at you know Old Norse studies, there was lots of, in the early 1900s, uh, late 18, early 1900s, lots of studying for the sake of nationalism and using our research. Look how great our history and our ancestors were. Let's, let's use this for nationalist propaganda. Um, and that happened all over Europe, especially Northern and Eastern. Um, and what we're seeing today is the same techniques, except people having a 24-7 uh, social media device in their pocket, so everyone can be reached by the message. So, you know, what could have been a bunch of nationalist Swedes fetishizing their ancestors, you know, wrestling techniques, um, not, they advertise that and people of Swedish ancestry or European ancestry or just disenfranchised, you know, working class white guys in the US, they see that blog, they see that video, they see it on YouTube and they, they get hooked. So one of the groups I have the biggest problem with called Norsk with two Ks, um, they were Scandinavian, but now they're, majority American and Canadian. Mm. Um, so the people who started it, or at least some of the founding members were uh, history buffs in, in and of Scandinavia. But on top of that, uh, they were kind of very pro-military as well. And that really made them attractive to a lot of <clears throat> a certain type of American. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now they have a huge following in America, and I think the majority of their recruiting uh, is, is in the US and Canada. Mm. Um, so do I think it's something to worry about? I mean, I don't think it's a good thing. We can, I, I'll get into some of the problematic aspects of it more, but just broadly, I don't think it's something to worry about, especially in academia. Um, in my experience, academics and academia at large, shun this kind of person, especially once their, once their uh, aims have been rooted out and, oh, okay, this person is becoming an expert in Scandinavian history because they want to promote it in this certain light. Mm -hmm. um, I've encountered a couple people in my studies in Iceland kind of going down that path and they were universally shunned and are no longer in academia. So I don't think it's a problem the educated masses aren't going to suddenly be tricked or, or coerced into thinking 
or believing these kind of nationalist exaggerations of the past. Mm -hmm. um, but the average conservative minded, insecure, uh, you know, uh, militant type mm -hmm. from wherever they are, uh, they very well, they can and do see the allure of it, unfortunately. I mean, mm -hmm. look at polit look more broadly at Western politics and you can see that there's people attracted to uh, violence and misogyny and people who aren't. So well, I was thinking about that there's a there's an argument about the 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 logic of of diaspora for intensifying things. So, the, you know, if you look at the the popularity of something that's a quintessentially English martial art like Bartitsu, right? The, the people the the vast majority of people interested in it are in North America. And, and if you're saying that the, the, the vast majority of interest in, in this Norse group and so on, and this, this kind of ethos and ideology and fantasy structure is in North America, then it's a, it, it, it possibly reflects a kind of longing for a cultural origin that, exactly. that, that is a, that, like a kind of ethno-nationalism, like we're all white Europeans and our, and our roots are in the cold white North. That kind of that kind of fantasy structure is, and the people have argued for this in different ways. People have argued about this kind of Scandi chic and the kind of, you know, the the the, the, the arguments about whiteness and where 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 would white people's cultural roots be? And it's like, well, you know, if 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 black people's roots are in Africa and Asian people's roots are in Asia, then white people's must be in the in the white frozen north, right? And there's a kind of worrying ethno fascination there. Maybe yeah, reflecting an ethnophobia, I don't know. A couple, a couple, in my opinion, interesting points on that. Um, one, I'm pretty objective when I try to, uh, by my upbringing, by my traveling, I don't know, by my wiring, but I'm pretty objective when I look at this, like you're saying, ethno, well, this, this desire to have a ethnic lineage that you can be proud of. I get it. Um, I'm an American, Ukrainian, first generation immigrant who grew up in the Middle East. I don't personally care about that kind of stuff or identify with it. Um, I don't have anything to do with Scandinavia at all. I just really like the history and culture, just like my parents don't have anything ethnically to do with Arabic literature, but that's what they teach. Um, so I grew up being able to appreciate becoming an expert in someone else's culture without um, without having to emulate it or without having to have a personal connection. I'm always suspicious of people from a certain background who only study their own background. I don't know, I, I don't wanna get into that, but it's, you know, I wouldn't wanna study my own past because I don't think you can be objective about it, you know? Um, however, I can totally empathize with, I'll say from the American perspective, well, Blacks can be proud of Africa, even though they're American, and Asians can be proud of their culture. And, you know, you see lots of Irish pride, for example, in, in the US, but I also see lots of white people complaining, well, they're proud, you know, the Mexicans can be proud, the Asians can be proud, the Blacks can be proud, why can't I be proud? And you, you totally can, there's totally healthy ways to go about it. The real question is, why can't you be proud about it in a healthy way that is not, you know, trying to harm others? Because kind of circling back to the entry point, uh, yes, lots of these people are yearning for that, that ethnic history and the, that long genealogy and something to, you know, a, a vague past to be proud of, but they're going about it in an extremely toxic way. If you're, uh, proud of your heritage, that's fine. But you know what comes to mind uh, in a vacuum, if you think of the term Viking, right? Fighting, warfare, rape, pillage, right? Axes, blood, um, just, you know, uh, and you know, no women allowed, no women are involved, uh, all white. And that, you know, the, the, the no women was, uh, because of the, in that time in history, women were suppressed in Scandinavia like they were everywhere else, pretty much. Um, but so that, you know, you can get a pass on, well, we don't have women in our group uh, because 
they didn't. But then there's also things like, well, with Viking, it, it's just they're attracted to the violence. It, it really isn't. They're so proud of Scandinavia, especially these Americans, you know, 10th generation Americans who don't even know what their heritage is, suddenly being attached to this Viking story, you know, hint, it's not because of Scandinavia or their beautiful literature and history that they're being attracted to that. It's because Vikings are virile and white and uh, misogynistic and violent and they can kill and they were the best warriors. Those are all the points they focus on. For all of Scandinavia's beautiful history, especially Iceland, because they wrote down everything, they were the, the scribes of Europe, um, uh, at least of Northern Europe, they wrote down everything, but th those aren't the parts, the literature and the education, those aren't the parts that these people seem to be um, gravitating towards. Mm. So obviously there's a link between a kind of insecure desire to be dominant to other ethnicities, races, cultures, whatever, and this allure of fighting like a Viking. And it, it's not just fighting, it's often living like a Viking, having the survival skills. And um, you can kind of see that all funnels more and more narrowly into one direction, which is, uh, uh, well, well, it sounds like you've described nationalism. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like you've painted a, a, the picture of the 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 modern the modern Viking martial arts reconstructionist as somehow identifying with the the ultimate image of the toxic masculinity. <laughs> it's like I'm sure that's not all, right? I'm sure it it can't be all people who have an interest in 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 learning to do this kind of stuff for all reasons but so you think they're they're suspect until they've until they've exonerated themselves somehow by by demonstrating an interest in broader things like facts literature culture i don't know history no yes that's for the most part true but from the other direction which is in my opinion you're exonerated until you show me something suspicious okay um and i also encountered tons of groups especially Ausatru, which is like um, the old, the traditional Old Norse religion where you worship uh, Freya, Odin, and Thor. Um, they get a bad rap because lots of white supremacists join their ranks for similar reasons, this kind of attachment to uh, uh, a proud white history. But there's lots of Ausatru members. The majority of Ausatru are just religious pagans uh, and race and culture aren't central to their beliefs. Everyone's welcome. So there's lots of that. And even within Viking martial arts, there's lots of, um, I won't say lots of, but I encounter them and it's a breath of fresh air. Um, other experts or enthusiasts or just hobbyists who truly like the culture objectively, they understand, you know, what actually was and wasn't Viking. They usually avoid the term Viking unless it's for marketing purposes. Mm -hmm. um, and they have a real handle on what's going on. And to uh, honest, good folk appreciating, you know, Norwegians appreciating their Norwegian culture in a healthy way. There's mm -hmm. plenty of that. And I just want to make sure that, you know, that exists and it's good. And that's not what I'm referring to. Okay. Um, so just um, just to, because we've, I mean, although this is being recorded and people will have the option to watch or listen again to get a sense of of clarity about, context, about what yeah. you what what we are for and what we are against here, are you gonna is this gonna be written down and published anywhere? Have you got an article in the pipeline that could set out in terms that are stable and we can refer to them like where you see the problems and where you see you know the, the yeah, constructive I, aspects and so on is there anything coming out well yes and no uh, i i polished up that presentation from the martial arts studies conference and made it into a paper this summer and ben judkins has it now uh and something i think is happening with that on the horizon Okay. Uh, I'm not sure of the dates, but yes, it, it is written up and expanded upon uh, and, and pretty succinct. I, I go into specific groups 
-hmm. which groups and what their sins are mm -hmm. and and try to get the rationale behind you know why they're guilty of of the crime i'm accusing them of uh, and i even go as far uh, for academics for academic purposes to go into a kind of red flag checklist uh, that any martial art can use but uh, particularly useful when dealing with uh, Scandinavian martial art, um, a, a red flag checklist of what, uh, what things are, you know, what behaviors should you look out for in anyone professing um, ethnic or genealogical connection to their own martial art. Mm -hmm. uh, and things to look out for to see whether they're being, you know, genu uh, genuine and to see whether or not, you know, it has potential to turn toxic. Um, and of course, it's about 10 things. And if you check them all off, mm -hmm. you know, run for your life. If you check <laughs> off one or two, not necessarily a bad thing. Three or four, pretty suspicious. Right. So it, it, it can kind of be used as a barometer. Um, okay. So we need to check. We need to, we need to look on Ben Judkin's blog, which is Kung Fu Tea. So we shall um, yeah. ChineseMartialStudies.com. So, so we'll give a couple examples. Um, yeah. One of them is... Uh, and I, I like bringing this up because I was shocked uh, finding out how prevalent it is, uh, prevalent. Uh, one of them is misogyny, which you wouldn't necessarily think has, you know, doesn't necessarily have to do with any martial art in particular, but the groups, uh, the, the, so, the look at the social aspect of these groups and every single one of them was unbelievably misogynistic. Ones that are official hate groups, you know, the Southern um, Poverty Law Center declares them as officially a hate group, and other ones that, I, as I say, they walk the line of deniable plausibility or plausible deniability. Yeah. Um, some of them you really have to analyze before you come to a conclusion, but others, you know, wear it on their sleeve. Uh, and misogyny is one of them, obviously. Um, Ethnic superiority or racism is another obvious red flag, uh, but the the one that I found the one I had the most fun with was the plausible deniability, because in the modern social media age, every advert you do, every post can be reblogged or or forwarded or shared, uh, and get these guys in trouble. And they don't want to be known as a hate. Well, some of them want to be known as a hate group. Mm. Some of them, literally, are but they don't want that negative press um, because they get money from people and uh, you know jo members joining and they don't want to lose that that revenue by people going wait i don't want to be part of a hate group mm -hmm. um, i just i just hate women and minorities and think that my culture is the best i don't want to be part of a hate group <laughs> um, <laughs> officially i don't want it on my cv yeah, yeah. so um, what the the mental gymnastics and the the wordplay they use to plausibly deny that they are a hate group is disturbing and fascinating in equal measure. Um, so I really, saying I enjoyed looking into it sounds perverse almost, but <laughs> it was really eye-opening and it was really interesting to see that because of social media, these people need some kind of PR. I mean, not everyone's the KKK, you know? You join the KKK, you know what you're getting into. A lot of these groups don't want that negative press, but they share the same ideologies. Mm -hmm. So they try to very politely say things like, we're not homophobic. We just strictly support the nuclear family, you know, the traditional family. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, anytime you hear statements like that, the more you dig behind it, the more you realize, no, you, you do have a problem with people who are different. Mm -hmm. um, but... I can't sue you or I can't, you know, I can't hold you accountable for that because you worded it with just enough leeway that you can slink out of it. But mm. in, in any of these groups, no matter how smart their wordplay is, um, their their actions are transparent. You can you can tell pretty quickly. OK, OK. So we must press Ben Judkins to get this published. I'll, I'll, I'll email him immediately. <laughs> After, <laughs> after after this um, in in his defense he let me know he's busy and doesn't know what's going on and yeah. i'm finishing up my thesis so i'm on another planet yeah um but yeah i i thought it was really interesting and 
not not to uh, <laughs> not to self-aggrandize overly, but I think something useful for martial arts studies in general, you know, on, in the academic sense, to look at this and and see in in my you know case study. Mm. Uh, how to identify these people and what kind of you know negative impact they have and what techniques they use to appear benign, mm -hmm. um, because yeah. you know with martial arts comes a lot of machismo. So you get every once in a while you get a person who you can't tell if they're really enthusiastic or if they're actually you know borderline delusional. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this could kind of be a barometer for that. Yeah, and I think it's really important to look at to look at these these cases which we might position as extreme, but maybe they also speak to things that that maybe course through our veins and our and our passions in in more subtle ways. I don't know. I think it could be it could be very educational to um, to explore these supposedly we do, you know we tend to dis distinguish ourselves from groups that are explicitly or obviously to us are, are kind of ideologically problematic but maybe we can reflect back on our own practices and our own values as martial artists or as people who love different aspects of martial arts like what is it why do i love this you know what what like that thing when you're talking about the the viking as the if you if you abstract the viking from from all historical fact what what is it about it that's fascinating and it is just the the sheer brutality of it um yeah i wonder if we can do that with other figures as well but i Which, think we, by the way an, an irony that i like is yeah. that lima the modern sport is often referred to as the gentle art or gent and Judo. lots of the violent moves were removed like a hundred years ago from the official rule set because like judo or jujitsu it's supposed to be skill and technique trumping yeah. power and strength yeah. now of course in the modern world we know that weight classes exist for that very reason yeah. even within skilled uh yeah. martial arts size and strength advantage make a real difference. Um, somehow a hundred years ago, we weren't quite there yet <laughs> in the martial arts world, but we, we are now. But even then, they, they still have, they didn't used to have weight classes in Glima. Now there's three. And anyone who's done any judo on, you know, even the most fundamental level and does Glima realizes it's all the same um, tricks on torque and hip positioning and leverage mm -hmm. more more than power in fact power has very little to do with it you only put power into a move once you have the grips done the space filled and you're ready to to execute and even then it's more of an explosiveness that's not really dependent on strength mm -hmm. um so actual modern glima is very much like jujitsu and judo where it's humble, it's it's nonviolent for the most part, and it's very not machismo. So it's it's weird. These Viking martial arts enthusiasts have a literally a, a, a Scandinavian glima that they can say there's they can call their own and be proud of and trace it back. Mm -hmm. But instead, but instead of following that, they just go straight for we want viking violence there's not enough axes we need more axes and, and pole arms and things the, the, the number <laughs> the number of viking martial arts experts who keep who insist on training combat glima where you have weapons and stuff this never existed it just never existed but they have to add the axes and weapons and armor you have to dress up um i keep seeing uh arm bars and jujitsu techniques being thrown into glima from a thousand years ago just didn't exist they did not do arm bars they didn't or, or if they did it was never written down or spoken about and there's no way you knew that um so yeah it's weird they have this very beautiful elegant almost martial art but they choose to first of all bastardize its name glima by mixing it in with all wrestling in the past and then they choose to ignore the present version and focus on the Viking part. So going back to what you said, there's something, it's not the history they like, it's the violence, you know? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, Kais, on that point, 
I'm going to I'm going to end it there and I'm going to say that's <laughs> very very uh, enlightening and I want to thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me today my pleasure